Hi there everyone. Today I am very excited to share a new frame with you and that's this, the AOS UL5. Now this is my take on an ultralight 5 inch frame. I'm going to be taking you through the design of this frame on the bench and we're going to be looking at every element of the design. I'm also going to be showing you an example build, this build, to give you an idea of the types of parts you can select to get the most out of the UL5 frame. We're going to be looking at a black box log analysis and a frame resonance analysis of the design so you can see how it performs in flight. And if you'd like to try out the UL5, there are links in the video description to where you can order one today. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into looking at this frame in a bit more detail. So I want to start by talking a little bit about the philosophy behind the UL5. And I can't really do that without comparing it to a normal 5-inch frame. So I've put it side by side here with a prototype of the AOS 5 V2, which is a frame I'm going to be launching very, very soon. And this is a top secret prototype, so don't tell anyone that I've shown you this. But we can see immediately that the diameter of the props is the same. They both run 5-inch props. But the UL5 is running very light pitch bi-blade 5-inch props rather than a tri-blade prop. And this is really the key differentiator between the UL5 and the standard AOS5. The UL5 is trying to achieve a very low disc loading. And what that means is that the area that the props sweep as they spin is very, very large in comparison to the weight of the drone overall. And that gives it some particular flight characteristics. It's very, very grippy in the corners. You can't fling the drone quite the same, but it is more responsive and connected through corners. And it can change direction very, very quickly without experiencing bad prop wash and things like that. When you move from three blades to two blades, you reduce the amount of torque that's required from the motor. And you can see that while the AOS5 is running a 2207 motor, the UL5 is running a much smaller 2104 motor. Because that motor is smaller, it's lighter. And that means that we can use a lighter, thinner arm without compromising the resonance performance. So we've now moved from a six millimeter thick arm on the AOS5 down to a five millimeter thick arm on the UL5 and also the section is much narrower. And so we're starting to save weight here. As we move to the center of the body of the UL5, we've also made the body much shorter and that has had the effect of bringing the props in view of the camera the props aren't in view on this drone, but they are on the UL5. But by making that body a lot, lot shorter, we also continue to save weight. And so we're pushing towards our goal of this very, very low disc loading that we want to get that responsiveness and that feel in the air, a feel that is more like a toothpick than a standard five inch drone. Because we have smaller motors, they require less peak power, less peak current, and that means that we can also save weight by using a smaller battery. So if we compare a standard five inch battery, this is an 1100 milliamp hour 6S pack, and we compare it to the battery that I run on the UL5, which is an 850 milliamp hour 4S, you can see that the battery is much, much smaller. And that's all enabled because of the smaller motors and the lower torque and current requirement of the prop. So all of these weight savings are adding up and that's really helping us get to this really, really low disc loading. Let's talk now a bit more about the frame design and I can show you all the different elements of the design and how they work together. So before I get into talking about the frame design, one of the really exciting things that I'm pleased to be able to offer with the UL5 is a choice of colored carbon fiber. And if you buy from CNC drones, you have a choice of blue, red, gold, green, and silver, I think. But uh, you can see all the available colors when you order. You can also get colored standoffs. So red standoffs for the red drone and blue standoffs for the blue drone. And there are a bunch of other colored standoffs as well, including green, I think, and yellow. So let's start by talking about the arm on the UL5. 
It uses a 12 by 12 motor mount. So this is pretty standard for ultralight five inch drones. This gives you a pretty wide choice of 1806, 2104, 2105, even up to 23 millimeter motors from some manufacturers. And you definitely want to be sticking with a, a light motor, a 12 by 12 mounting. The arm is five millimeters thick and it has this truss structure providing additional torsional stiffness for the arm and also additional strength. And this allows the arm to be very slender and that of course gives it a really good efficiency, it doesn't block the thrust column from the prop and also it keeps the weight down. By stabilizing the arm at this central point, we reduce the length of unsupported arm that is going to be affected by a torsional mode like this as well as the length of arm that's going to be affected by a bending mode. And the result is that the resonance performance of the UL5 is just as good as the resonance performance of any typical five inch frame. So you're not going to be losing out on vibration and resonance performance with the UL5 compared to a normal frame. And the five millimeter thick arms on the UL5 also address another key criticism of ultralight frames, which is that the arms break too easily in even light crashes. With the five millimeter thick arms on the UL5, you're much less likely to break them in a light crash. And if you do break an arm, just like with pretty much every other AOS frame, replacing the arm is only two screws and neither of those two screws are ever gonna be shared with your electronics. The screws for the frame are M3 steel screws. And I did have a discussion with my patrons about whether they wanted M3 or M2 screws. And in the end, we decided that M3 was going to be the right choice. It's much more durable. It's much less likely to strip out, um, particularly when you have long arms like this. The force that you can apply into these joints in a, in a hard crash is actually quite high. And there is a risk of, of stripping out or damaging M2 hardware. Also, it gives the option to use aluminium or titanium M3 screws in your build if you want to. So you can go out and buy aluminium or titanium screws of the right length and then just swap them for the steel ones. And if you do that, you can save about seven grams. I actually prefer steel hardware because I've had big issues with aluminium and titanium hardware stripping out. So I'm a big fan of steel screws, but obviously if you want to use aluminium screws, um, you absolutely can do. The versatility of the mounting in the AOS UL5 is something that I think is a real key feature of the design and something that I'm really proud of. There are two stacks, front and rear, and you can have a 20 by 20 or a 25 by 25 millimeter mounting on both of those stacks. In the middle, you have the choice of a 20 by 20 mount, a 25 by 25 mount, or a 30 by 30 mount. And critically, the 30 by 30 mount is big enough that you can fit the um, HD0 one watt VTX in the center of this frame if you really want to. So this could be really good for someone who's looking to use the UL5 in a, a long range rig. But whatever you want to use the frame for, you're going to be able to fit all of the electronics you need easily inside. And we're going to look a little bit more into one example of the electronics you could use in the build later on. The camera plates on the UL5 support 20mm cameras like the original DJI camera and also 19mm cameras. There's just a little bit of flex in the camera plate which allows you to mount either type of camera and it's going to be nice and secure, it's not going to move around. On the top plate we have a 32 by 32 millimeter standard GoPro mounting. This is the same mounting pattern as most other AOS frames, the AOS 5, the AOS 5.5 and the AOS 7 all use this mounting pattern and this frame does as well. So if you did want to mount um, some form of action camera probably I'd suggest a lighter one, maybe something like an Insta360 Go, then you have the mounting to do that. Also, there's an, a nice place in the middle to mount a battery strap, 
and then you can also mount a second battery strap in the rear if you want to as well and it gets held nicely in place by the curve of the cutout on this top plate. Overall the top plate has been cut out to reduce the weight as far as possible but we're leaving in the elements that are providing torsional stiffness to the top plate which is so important. And you'll also see that the camera plates lock into the top plate here and they also lock in with a half depth cutout here as well. So that keeps them really secure uh, when you're tightening the camera down and stops anything moving around in a, a crash or anything like that. And then at the back there's obviously the, the AOS logo is also machined into the top plate as well. The standoffs for the design are 20 millimeter standoffs, which is a very standard length. So if you want to get replacement standoffs or different colors or you'd prefer knurled or anything like that it's going to be very very easy for you to find exactly the standoffs that you want in this 20 millimeter length. So now we've talked a little bit about the frame let me take the top plate off this build and we'll talk through the electronics that I've used in my UL5. So with the top plate off we can see all the components of the build nice and clearly. Let's start with the props. I'm using these HQ T-mount props. They're 5x2 props. So that means they're bi-blade props and they're very light pitch. So they're ideal for um, achieving that really low disc loading and also they have very moderate torque requirement which means you can use a motor that's a little bit smaller than what you would normally use on a 5 inch drone. The motors that I'm using on this build are the Emacs Eco 2 2104 motors and I did a video, I'll put a link to that down in the video description, showing these motors and comparing them with some other ultralight 5 inch motors. And to my mind the Eco 2 has actually performed the best out of, out of all the motors that I looked at, which is great considering they were also the cheapest, so I couldn't really... Uh, I couldn't really justify using any other motor on this build apart from the Emacs Eco 2. If we look at the electronics now, the flight controller is the iFlight Beast F7 V2 flight controller. And this is actually the flight controller with the BMI 270 gyro. And in looking at this gyro, I've been able to find um, some OSR modes that allow you to improve the filtering that's available with the gyro. Um, above what you get with just the, the standard normal mode. So if you have a flight controller like this with a BMI 270 gyro, then um, please drop me an email and I can give you the test code for that. But the OSR4 mode on this flight controller performs really, really well. Um, it's very similar to the MPU 6000, so it's a, a really great flying flight controller um, with that mode enabled. Obviously it's got a super high current rating, I think it's a 55 amp rating, which is more than enough to run these motors. And because I'm running it on 6S, I've included this 470 microfarad capacitor and I've soldered that directly onto the battery pads there. The flight controller is mounted with the USB port facing out of the back and that makes it super, super easy to plug into the drone. In fact, I really like this position for the flight controller because it is just that easy to plug in. If you have the USB port on the side in the UL5, um, you can still plug into it, but it's a little bit tighter with respect to these standoffs. And some Whoop flight controllers, you might need to remove a standoff in order to plug the USB in. So I would definitely suggest considering placing the flight controller in the back and having the USB come out backwards because that's going to give you the, the easiest place to plug in. In the front we have a naked Vista with the Cadex Nebula Pro and I think the naked Vista works really really well in this design particularly mounted in the front because there's plenty of, of space for it here you can run the antenna out along the arm which is what I like to do to avoid the antenna uh, waggling around and creating vibration and similar to the flight controller I've set the USB port for the Cadex Vista facing backwards and it's actually pretty easy to plug in even with the top plate on you can feed 
a USB plug down inside the drone and then plug in very easily like that. And you could see that you can do that easily even with the top plate on. So I'll try. The Vista is soft mounted on some gummies so it can move around just a little bit and that avoids there being any problems in, in hard crashes or anything like that. I've used 16mm M2 screws to mount the Vista and that ensures that those screws don't interfere with the camera plates and there's plenty of height. And I've used some um, M2 spacers just to separate the two boards so that they don't touch and short out on each other. With this frame you can use the original DJI camera, you can use the Cadex Nebula Pro or the um, Polar. Most cameras for the DJI system are either 19 or 20 millimeters, so you'll probably be able to fit anything in there. If you want to run analog or shark bite on the frame, it's super easy again to mount an analog VTX or a shark bite uh, race V2 20 by 20 VTX or the 25 millimeter whoop VTX for shark bite in the front here and that's going to be super easy to then solder that to the flight controller and get it all up and working. Whatever system you use, I would always advise using a, an antenna like this, maybe with a UFL or an MMCX connector, and then one of these long flexible antennas that you can then secure tightly to an arm with cable ties. That's going to be the most durable and also the lowest vibration solution. And the battery that I would advise using with the AOS UL5 is something like this 850 milliamp hour 4S or possibly a 550 milliamp hour 6S pack, although you could go smaller if you really, really need to keep the weight down. Something like the GNB 380 milliamp hour 6S pack that's designed for use with the 250 is also absolutely appropriate for this frame and it's probably what you're going to want to go for if you're targeting sub 250 grams. I'm actually using the DJI controller with this drone just because it makes it much easier to wire everything up. But if you wanted to use something like this Express LRS receiver then that's also going to be very very easy to fit somewhere down here. I would probably put it just mount it to the flight controller with some double sided tape or potentially you could also mount it to the, the Vista unit up here. There's even space for it just behind the camera. These things are so tiny that you can squeeze them in almost anywhere and that would be perfect if you wanted to uh, to use a different radio than the, the DJI radio. It wouldn't be an AOS frame launch without a thorough resonance analysis of the frame and a look at some black box logs. So that's what we're going to do now. This is the resonance analysis for the roll axis and I'm showing here the frequency versus throttle plot from um, an approximately five minute flight with the frame. It's quite a hard freestyle flight, lots of hard prop wash turns, um, sharp flips and rolls, that sort of thing. We can see down here are the flight frequencies below about 50 hertz or so. These are the sharp flips and rolls, prop wash, that sort of thing. We can see here two motor bands. This is the fundamental frequency for the motors. And then this is the first harmonic here. And we can also see a little bit of the second harmonic here as well, but it's much, much fainter. If we're looking at frame resonances, we can see that there's a frame resonance here, faintly visible at high gain at 155 hertz and also a little resonance about here maybe at 273 hertz also quite faint and only really visible at low throttle. If we look at the mode shapes that correspond to those frequencies we can see that for the 155 hertz we have this very um, traditional very common uh, mode shape where the motors are moving up and down alternately. This is typically the lowest frequency for almost any quad design. And it's really nice to see that it's occurring at a really nice high frequency of 155 hertz. That's getting it up and out of the region where it's going to cause any problems and into a region where the dynamic notch filter in beta flight can really crisply filter it out with minimal delay. The second roll frequency it's up at a much higher frequency and this is again the first of one of these torsional modes where we have the motors twisting on the end of the arm. And this is where the 
the bracing strap that you can see that cuts across halfway up the arm really helps stiffen up the frame against this mode and push that frequency much much higher and up at 273 hertz if the dynamic notch filter does lock onto it it's not going to really be introducing much delay at all and honestly these modes are so diffuse that I'm not even sure whether it's it's something that the dynamic notch would lock onto, but certainly this 155 hertz mode could definitely be uh, one that the dynamic notch can lock onto and, and prevent that noise getting through to the PID loop. A benefit of having the frame resonance at about 155 hertz is that you can see that for a wide range of throttle positions, this resonance is sitting in a quiet zone. So there's not much excitation at about 150 hertz in a quadcopter frame, which means that that mode is not being rung very strongly at all. If we look now at the pitch axis, we can see that there's a very diffuse resonance, barely visible around 260 hertz at high gain. I, I'm, I can sort of pick it out just outside of the, the motor band noise, but it's, it's not very much stronger than just the normal motor noise. You can also see a really sharp line at the blade passing frequency of the dynamic idle RPM here at 100 hertz and there's also a first harmonic here as well. And this is occurring because I've got my dynamic idle for this quad set to 3000 RPM. We've got two blades on the props and so that's giving us a blade passing frequency of 6000 RPM or 100 hertz. So you can see that here, but it's only visible at very low throttle because it's only at very low throttle that uh, dynamic idle is actually going to be active. Obviously, at higher throttle positions, the motors are going to be spinning very much faster than the dynamic idle value. And looking at the yaw axis, I mean, yaw is typically very quiet and there's really nothing um, to see here in terms of resonances. You just get I hope you enjoyed the video and that you feel like you have the information you need to decide whether the AOS UL5 is the right frame for your next ultralight 5 inch build. If you like the frame, there are links down in the video description to where you can order one today, and I would love to know in the comments which color you decide to go with. Um, I really like the blue, but that's just me. If you'd also like to know where to get a t-shirt like this, then I'll put a link down in the video description. This is one of the new designs that I'm bringing out to celebrate the launch of the version 2s of the AOS 5 and 5.5, which are going to be coming very, very soon. So stay tuned, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that launch video when it comes out. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.